Good morning and another beautiful day to you. Hope you're having an excellent day. Now, a milestone. We have finally crossed the Sahara Desert. It seems a long time ago since we drove down the west coast in Morocco, got to Mauritania, and driven over 10,000 kilometers to reach the border of Sudan and the edge of the Sahara Desert. It has been a remarkable journey. When you put it into Google Maps now, they show you three different routes, and none of them are the route we took. <laughs> it says, go round the coast as their primary route, which we, to be fair, we wanted to do, couldn't do because of political climate and lack of visas. The other option, it says, go through Central Africa, just, just, just avoid the desert, and then one that goes round the south edge of the desert. But we didn't, we ignored all that. We didn't even have Google Maps. We had our trusty Chris Scott book and we drove pretty much across the southern edge of the desert and we have made it. So now it's time for farewell to the pyramids of Sudan and the friendly people. Really, Sudan surprised me. It was an amazing country. Um, and we got to explore so little of it because so much of it is desert and so much of it is, was in turmoil, is in turmoil unfortunately, that uh, we could only see a very small amount of it. But we actually then went across Sudan and then we came to an even more surprising country. I would say that the next country we went to, still to this day, was the most surprising country, not just in Africa, but that anywhere in the world that I have visited. Ethiopia. Now, partly from the 80s and a lot of history that, uh, you know, that we've heard, but Ethiopia, you think of starving children, dry, arid landscapes, no food. <sighs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Ethiopia is a vibrant, beautiful, friendly, if very troubled country. There's Ethiopia and Eritrea, um, the politics and, and things between them is very, very messed up. And especially in those days, actually, I don't think it's got any better. It may have it got better in the middle, now it's got worse. But the um, travel around Ethiopia was, is very restricted. We were lucky that we went when we did go, because we got to some places that now are right in the heat of a, a basic local tribal war and a rebellion and all sorts of things that are going on that make a lot of these areas and a lot of Ethiopia, unfortunately, unsafe to go to at all at the moment. And I hope that changes because there are some areas of Ethiopia that I didn't get to on our first trip, never managed to get to since, and I really want to get back to. But we did cross from Sudan into Ethiopia, trouble free, not really a great deal along that road. The officials are very, very super friendly and easy, both from leaving Sudan and going into Ethiopia at that time. And we took a chance and headed north into Ethiopia. Now, this is the problem problem area, the most risky area of Ethiopia to go to. But while we were there, it had been quiet for a little while. So we took our chances because that was the main area that we wanted to see and one of the most difficult areas to access in Ethiopia. And there was three key areas we wanted to see in the north. Lalabella, Aksum and the Simeon Mountains. So we headed to Lalabella first. And this is an amazing, Lalabella and, and Aksum are the religious centres, shall we say, of Ethiopia. Right out in the wild mountains, beautiful landscape. But uh, what makes Lalabella particularly impressive is these amazing churches that have been carved in the shapes of crosses down into solid granite rock and limestone, different types of rock. Um, They've not been built, they basically, there was a huge solid rock and the church was carved down, and I'm not talking like a one, I'm talking a two, three proper sized church carved down into these rocks. And that was um, any from where, from the third to the 10th century when they built these. Some of these took decades by hand to build these churches. And when you walk around Lelabella, you can't see them because they're not buildings sticking up. You just come to the edge, oh, there's a drop, and there's a church carved down into these rocks. It is absolutely phenomenal. There's lots of theories as to 
where these churches, you know, why they came from, where the fear, where the idea behind them came from. And that also links into Axum. Now, we got to Lalabella, but it wasn't safe for us to unfortunately go to Axum. Axum is where, again, there's more churches, less built down into the ground. But Axum is where they claim, a lot of people claim, that the Ark of the Covenant is now hidden away. Because, from the Bible, they say the Queen of Sheba actually came from Ethiopia. And she travelled up to see Solomon, um, saw all his riches, got all the wisdom from there, and bore him a son. They were naughty, naughty. And uh, when she travelled back to her, fam to her homeland of Ethiopia, she took the religious tenets of the Christian faith, the early Christian faith, uh, or the Old Testament faith, should we say, from Solomon, and was behind the building of these churches. And then when the when Jerusalem fell, that the before it fell, a lot of the treasures and the treasured Ark of the Covenant was smuggled out of Jerusalem and then taken and hidden in Ethiopia. So that is a fascinating story. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to Axum. It just wasn't safe for us at that time. So we enjoyed Lalabella and its fascinating um, history and looking around. And then from there we moved. From there we moved a little further south into the heart of the Simeon Mountains. Because Axum and Lalabella are sort of on the edge of the mountains, which gives them fantastic areas and beautiful, beautiful areas. I mean, you could have spent weeks going around that area exploring the beautiful landscapes, but it just wasn't safe. We actually had to cut our trip short because we were camping at the edge of this beautiful lake. I mean, it was gorgeous. It was tranquil. Um, nobody bothers you in that area. Nobody's even interested in you. We just found this area. It wasn't even a camping site. We just wild camp near a village at the uh, edge of the lake and we had two beautiful days over watching the birds on the lake. The third morning we woke up to fighter jets flying overhead really low down the lake and bombing <laughs> the far end of the lake, which was probably about 20 kilometers away. And then we could hear mortar fire and gunfire. And we said, it's time to leave. <laughs> it's like, you know, when you've got fighter jets roaring overhead, it is not a good place to be. Um, but that presented with another problem because we then drove to town and we'd been looking around the air for a little while and we couldn't find fuel because the locals knew what was going on. There was a semi-war brewing in that area and there was a shortage of everything and we want we wanted to go that to, to the capital Addis Ababa via the Simeon mountains so that's not a very direct route and we had to drive up into the mountains so we needed fuel to do that route so we actually then spent the entire next day queuing or tire that day queuing to get diesel because um, we had to, we, you, it was limited. But as a foreigner, we actually uh, did manage to get some extra fuel. But it was still, we got 20 litres from this depot, and they were all army depots. They were controlling the fuel distribution. And we had to go to the commander, get this letter explaining why we were there. I don't think he was very impressed with that. And that we needed fuel to leave. That he was anxious to give us. He did want us to leave. Um, I'll give him fair credit for that. So he actually helped us out. We had a military uh, police escort to these fuel stations. I felt really bad. We jumped all the queues. All these people like were trying to leave and we went right to the front of the queue. Got 20 litres here, 20 litres here. Eventually filled up the Land Rover and uh, drove out of town. Drove away from the explosions. Always a wise idea. And we went into the relative peaceful, actually no, not relative, total peacefulness of the Simeon Mountains. Now, I've got a particular attraction to mountains. I love climbing and I've climbed all the major peaks in Africa. Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, the Ruanzori Mountains, Mount Margarita. Um, and I really wanted to add the peak in the Simeon Mountains, which is Mount Rashidashan. Uh, to my list of peaks that I've climbed in Africa. I think it's about the fifth or sixth highest peak in the continent. Uh, it's about 4,550 metres. And it's right in the middle of the Simeon National Park. So we got to the entrance of the park because the whole mountain range is a national park, by token, because there's just nobody there, which is one thing that makes it fantastic. Um, 
but it's you know yet to be really discovered. And of course, there's so many troubles in the area; it's still not getting discovered. And now, nowadays, there's more troubles there than ever. So I'm, I really fear for the area. But, but back 20 years, we got to the gate, and they really weren't sure whether to let us in or not at the, at the sort of entrance. Um, and there were sort of like reports. There was fighting breaking out as we had discovered further north and it was like nobody really knew what was going on and and of course in those days communication was far slower than it is now this is 20 years ago no mobile phones no internet no wi-fi you know to tell all these things um but eventually they did say okay we'll give you five day permit and you've got to get up there and come back in five days okay but you also must take armed guards with you and um that was the deal. So we had to have armed guards that came with us and we had to provide everything for them, apart from their gun and hopefully bullets. I'm not sure about that. But you know, their food, accommodation, transport was all on us. Well, that's okay. We had room for them um, and we had food for them. And uh, so we did that. So we had this great guy came along with us and um, I don't know how useful he would have been. Uh, but anyway, um, and off we trundled. Now the unique thing with Mount Rashdashan is that in and, and Simeon Mountains, in most of the areas, there's actually tracks because there's loads of villages living in these valleys. Um, so there's a track where, with a four wheel drive, you can actually drive to the base camp of the Mount Rashdashan, um, which I think we drove the Land Rover at one point to over 4,000 meters. Now, Lara, our landy, is a um, a naturally aspirated turbo diesel and they need air oxygen to work properly so as we got higher and higher and steeper and steeper the engine power dipped and dipped and at some points it was just like even it looked like a gentle slope we were just climbing at a snail's pace up because it just takes away from the power of the engine but we got to the base camp uh, that was a good two days drive. On the way up, we camped at this beautiful pace where we witnessed a thunderstorm when the thunderstorm was below us in the clouds. We could actually see the lightning coming up from the clouds. And there was a big storm there and we were sitting watching it. It was amazing witness of nature. And also, as we drove through, we looked down these valleys and you could see villages dotted in the bottom of these valleys. And you wonder, they look completely cut off. I mean, they maybe don't have visitors ever. I mean, it's a truly remarkable and beautiful area. We got to base camp, set up base camp, and uh, we'd already taken two days to get there. So we had one opportunity to the next morning, get up early, before dawn, climb to the peak, get there for sunrise, um, have a little look around, enjoy the beauty, then get back to base camp before heading down before our five days was up. Now there's three, apart from the beautiful scenery, incredible people and all sorts of other things, there's three very unique things to look for in the Simeon Mountains. One is the Simeon Ibex, which is like a goat with these massive horns. The next is the Ethiopian wolf, which is a slightly smaller than the native North American wolf, but very similar in, in, in colour and shape. And then there's Gelada baboons. Uh, these are extra furry baboons with a beautiful red heart on them. And those three species are completely unique in the world to the Simeon Mountains. And of course, we wanted to see them. Um, the chance of seeing them is very, very low because, I mean, these are endangered species, the only ones of their kind in the world living in this vast mountain range. So you're very, very lucky if you see them. But that's what we really wanted to see. So next morning we were up. The other thing with the Simeon Mountains is uh, uh, it gets really cold at night and really hot in the day because they have such extremes. The problem with access into the Simeon Mountains is that some of the peaks go over 4,000 meters high and they dip to valleys that are under sea level. So you've got these thermals that tear through during when the sun comes up, the, uh, the heat pours into these valleys and wells up and you get this really claustrophobic heat on you. And then at night, the opposite happens and it chill chills down. So we woke up in the morning and it was only about one degree when we got up. We put a few layers on, we started walking. By the time the sun got up, it was, by the end, by midday, it was 32 degrees. You know, and you're trying to hike in that, having the coats that you had from earlier, camera gear. 
the actual climb to the peak is not it's not a technical climb it's not rock climbing you did need to have sturdy boots and there was some steep scrambling scrambles at some point but then you got to the top and the views were magnificent it really was beautiful and and i could tick another africa highest peak off my list as well it was a beautiful climb on the way up in the early morning light we saw at a distance climbing up a cliff opposite us the ibex so we were really happy to see that that was the number one off our list so we'd got one of the three rare animals to see we saw that then we got uh, to the top and when we were at the top we saw the ethiopian wolf just one but one is enough, it, uh, and there it was, a few hundred meters away from us, scrabbling around the rocks, and, and boom, it was gone. As soon as it detected us, it's away. So that was great, but no baboons. But, uh, and uh, oh no, we've got two of the three. I mean, we were so happy with two of the three, and we spent an hour at the peak. But the other thing with the peak, at that time of day, it was blisteringly hot, and we got sunburn because the air is so thin up there that you burn really, really easily. And it was a beautiful cloudless day at that point when we started coming down. So we finished up our water, said farewell to a fantastic view and ambled our way back to camp. Three to five hours, I think, took scrambling down and we're keeping our eyes peeled, trying to look out for the gelada baboons. You know, we wanted to see the last of them. You know, they were the most common ones. We'd seen the two really rare ones and we hadn't seen the common rare one, if that makes sense. So we were sort of like, and then and it was getting dusk, evening time, half an hour from camp. We, you know, and the guide was really good. The guide was actually our security guide as well. He guided as well, he did everything, great guy. Um, didn't speak a word of English, but that didn't matter. And, uh, you know, he really, we went off trail. He went looking for them to see if he could find them. Couldn't find them. So, after a beautiful day and very tired, we roamed in, wobbled into camp. You know, it had been an exhausting day with the cold, then the heat and the climb. And a whole long day from before dawn to now just about dusk, we had been on our feet. And we rocked into the camp. And guess what? The camp is full of gelado baboons. <laughs> they were waiting for us. There must have been about 50 of them because they do travel in big, big troops. And there they were just sitting around the camp and they weren't bothered with us at all. Um, we just wandered amongst them. Obviously, it went too close. They're still wild animals. They didn't come close, close. But uh, they, were just, they completely surrounded our campsite. We were the only people there. And uh, it was great. So I did get some nice snaps of these these rare and beautiful um, gelada baboons and uh, we had our last night on top of Ethiopia 